Northwest. Um, I'm Susie Spickle, the Community Programs Director here at the Harris Center and one of the naturalists on staff. And I'm really excited to welcome you all to Ask a Naturalist, the Autumn Edition. Um, before we get started on the mysteries that were sent in, I'd like to go around and have our um, Harris Center staff introduce themselves. And I'll start with Miles, who will also tell you a little bit about tonight and some of our Zoom I guess, what are they? Our Zoom guidelines. So Miles, take it away. Zoom guidelines and etiquette. Um, I'm Miles. I'm the office manager at the Harris Center. Enjoy the program. Thanks, Miles. Jenna, how about you? Hi, everybody. I'm Jenna, and I'm a teacher naturalist at the Harris Center. And I also, once upon a time, was trained as an entomologist. So I tend to answer insect-related questions. Always so fascinating. I always learn so much. I'm always blown away by the insect world. How about- Well, and I put an insect fun fact in that chat too, for anyone who's interested. Oh. oh, how exciting. I haven't checked it yet. I will. Phil Brown, tell us about yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Brown. I'm the Hawk Watch Coordinator at the Harris Center, uh, working on uh, keeping track of fall raptor migration up on Pacman Adnock this fall. And I always have my binoculars ready. So uh, if I'm distracted at all, it's because a bird's flying past my window. Uh, but I'll be answering uh, bird-related questions most likely tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. I hope a bird flies past your window so we see you get it. Then we'll have to find out what. How about Brett Phelan? Tell us about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Brett. I'm the science director for the Harris Center. And at Ask a Naturalist, I tend to answer amphibian questions. Yay, to the amphibians. Jeremy Wilson, you're next. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeremy Wilson, the director at the Harris Center. I only answer questions about things with woody stems that hold branches high. Whoa, it's very specific, Jeremy. I think you must be talking about trees, right? And yeah. shrubs. OK, trees and shrubs. That's good to know. Trees and big shrubs. Let's put it out. No, no tiny shrubs. All right, that's good. All right, John Benjamin, who are you and what's your specialty? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am a teacher naturalist at the Harris Center, and I generally answer questions about mushrooms and fungi at these Ask a Naturalist uh, sessions. And I think I'll also be fielding a reptile question tonight, which is another topic I, I know a little bit about. So, John's being not modest. He knows a lot about reptiles and amphibians. I had the pleasure of um, running a camp with him this summer and I learned so much from him all the time. And Margaret, last but not least, tell us about yourself. Hi, uh, hi there, I'm Margaret Baker. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Um, I uh, design all the print materials for the Hair Center and um, help make the slides for our um, Ask a Naturalist programs look um, pull together. So I don't really answer questions unless I've got the photo in the wrong place or upside down or, um, you know, otherwise, you know, not looking right. Um, but he, I'm just here because I am really grateful that all you all send in things and I want to find out um, the answers to a lot of your questions too. So it's great to see you. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Margaret. I always like to say Margaret makes us look beautiful. She really does. So it's great to have her here. All right. And hello to everybody out there. Uh, finally, on to the program for Ask a Naturalist, our very, very first autumn edition um, of this year. So what's our first question? Aha. So I'll read it. It says, I have noticed an abundance of different mushrooms growing in my yard this year. And along with that, I've been seeing something that I had not seen before, squirrels eating mushrooms. The squirrels will eat some, but not all of the different types of mushrooms that are growing in my yard. So I was wondering, do mushrooms have the same effect on squirrels as they do on humans? Could we assume it is safe to eat the same mushrooms that we see the squirrels eating? Roland, and that was sent in in August. And I too have been noticing this. I'm gonna answer this question since mammals are kind of my thing, but I'm also going to invite John to pipe in a little bit to because um, he knows a lot about mushrooms. Um, and it's just a great question, Roland. And what I can say is that squirrels do love mushrooms. They're mycophages. They love to eat the mushrooms and the fungus and they eat all types of them. And in fact, all types of squirrels from our ground squirrel, the chipmunk to gray squirrels, to red squirrels and our flying squirrels, they will all consume mushrooms. 
And no, don't eat the same things that the squirrels are eating because squirrels have an incredible ability. They can eat some of the most poisonous mushrooms in the Amanita family. And that's the family that, that they've studied squirrels, this thing with squirrels on that I've read. Um, but it doesn't get ingested into their bloodstream. So they're able to eat the fungus and it passes right through them without any kind of harmful effects of the poisonous mushrooms. But John, you had a comment, you have read something about not all mushrooms can be eaten by um, rodents like squirrels. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, Susie, you know, uh, encapsulated it pretty well. Squirrels do eat many mushrooms that you should definitely not eat. They're, they have a very short digestive system. They don't digest and absorb the toxins the same way we do. And uh, especially in the Amanita family, there's the toxin, the, the amatoxins that tend to poison us don't tend to affect squirrels. So they will eat mushrooms that we should not and could not eat safely. Um, and um, you know, mush, uh, squirrels, uh, there's certain mushrooms they do tend to like more than others. I do find that uh, the Russula family, they love Russulas. You'll often find Russulas with bite marks or even stashed in tree branches sometimes or just, you know, sitting on a rock because the squirrel took it up there to munch on it and it's all chewed up. Um, I have heard accounts of, you know, rodents that can still be poisoned by some very toxic mushrooms. And I've never seen this. I don't quite know like if it's the destroying angels or some Amanitas that do this, but I have heard and read a little bit about, uh, you know, it, uh, some, if they ingest too much of a very toxic mushroom, it can still have a very detrimental, maybe even deadly effect. And I've also read that squirrels tend to nibble on mushrooms they're not familiar with and then take some time and see if they get sick uh, and then come back to it. Susie, do you know if that's a, a true yeah. squirrel behavior? Yes, I did read accounts of that as well. Um, one thing I will say is there was just a really fascinating study out by UNH. Um, um, they just um, published a study and I'm writing an article for Northern Woodlands on the study and I'm hoping to have the researchers speak in the spring. Ryan Stevens is, a, Dr. Ryan Stevens is one of the researchers and they're saying that small mammals in particular rodents are really important um, kind of mushroom pollinators, which is kind of weird. Um, so they eat underground mushrooms. They kind of, some of these um, rodents specialize in underground mushrooms called truffles, um, but they're not like the truffles you spend $4,000 on. They're just uh, New England truffles, not very tasty. But after they eat them, they kind of travel about. And then when they excrete this, they excrete the spores in their scat and the spores then have a new place to grow. And that these are actually really important important um, fungi for tree um, relationships. They help the trees out. And you've probably heard a little bit about that. You can, you'll be able to read more about that in my November article for Northern Woodlands. And you'll also be able to hopefully hear Dr. Ryan Stevens talk about it in the spring. So keep your eyes on the Harris Center, but we better move on because we've got a lot going on today. We have this, whoa, check this thing out. What is this? And what will it become from Francie? And um, Jenna, this looks like something for you to answer, even though it looks a little bit like scat. Um, I think it's caterpillar. So I Jenna, think you're right. Yeah. So um, a lot there's a lot of these. They're in a this caterpillar is in a group called the tussock moths, and um, this is one called the definite tussock moth. It's a really bizarre name, I think. Um, it's also called the definite marked tussock moth. And interestingly, I mean, this is a a bright yellow caterpillar. Um, it does any of these really, really fuzzy caterpillars that have these big tufts on them like this can, um, you should be really careful with handling them because they do ca can cause a rash or you know, skin irritation. Some of them have poison sacs at the base of some of the hairs that can actually like excrete the poison if it, if it's sort of, you know, fiddled with because that's their defense mechanism. Um, some of them, they're just irritating because they have little barbs or little spikes. Um, this one I read does not have poison sacs, but it does give a rash to those with particularly sensitive skin. Um, this will become a rather boring brown moth with no definite markings. So I don't really understand why it's called the definite tussock moth. But, um, so what's interesting about this one though, is that it has, uh, the female is wingless. So once she comes out of her pupa, she just sort of sits there and emits a pheromone and waits for the male to find her. 
And as a result, the male has to have these really branched antenna with a lot of olfactory receptors on them so that he can smell her and find her and mate with her. And then she just stays right there and excretes an egg and lays her eggs in a big blob. And she actually covers her um, the eggs with some similar types of like, you know how moths are fuzzy. So she puts some of her scales onto the egg sac to protect them because they're also irritating. So, oh, and their pupa cocoon is covered when they, when they, when it goes from caterpillar to cocoon, those little bright yellow irritating hairs are then gonna be coating and sort of embedded into the cocoon exterior to also defend that caterpillar or that pupa. So it's, it's got really good defense mechanisms and it eats lots and lots of different broadleaf trees. So everything from oak to maple to elm. Um, but they, we, I don't hear about these being a big outbreak pest. So we can just think about how pretty they are and think about how soft they might be if we touch them and don't touch them and just watch them walk away. Wow, Jenna, thank you so much. So fascinating. The definite tussock moth. The definite tussock moth caterpillar, yes. And just as another fun fact, they spend the winter as eggs. So if you see a very boring looking brown moth that uh, is attracted to a lump on a tree that might be the female, maybe that's it. And then the female will lay eggs and die and the eggs will overwinter until next spring when they will hatch out into these again. I know. Why does the male moth get all the fun of flying around? Doesn't seem (laughs) fair. All right, we'll move on. (laughs) Turn the tables. Oh, yes. People out there, we are about to play an audio and you're going to listen to it. This is actually an audio submitted by George on August 9th, 2021. Um, If you think you know what it is, you could put it right in the chat. And Miles, are we giving out a prize for the first answer in? Yes. Yes. So the first correct answer, and we'll have um, Brett and Phil be the judges of the first answer in. Is that okay, Brett and Phil? Okay, all right, are we ready? Quiet out there. we have a winner all right miles that was really cool thank you for putting that in there and phil would you like to reveal the winner and tell us um a little bit about it (laughs) sure i'm I'm gonna say that carl is the winner because he he did guess the species and um more often than not that sound is coming from the youngster of a barred owl so nice job carl um, yeah, the barred owl um, makes a lot of different vocalizations. It's the most common owl in the Monadnock region in New Hampshire, and really in a lot of the wooded northeast. This is a very familiar species in a lot of our backyards. If you're in a wooded setting, um, and you more often hear them do their, their who cooks for you call, but uh, in the late summer, uh, a lot of young owls are out there making some funny noises. They're out of their nest at that point. They're begging for food from their parents. And um, that that call is typically known as the, the whistle shriek. And it's thought to be an alarm call, um, but it's not really confirmed because we still don't know how to exactly speak to animals. Um, but that's the best we can tell is that this is a type of alarm call. Um, youngsters are trying to get their voices. So right now in the fall, a lot of owls are starting to become vocal um, and their their voices are changing a little bit. Um, in the late summer, you might be hearing this really high raspy shrieky sound. Um, there were a lot of them around this summer. I know a lot of us on Harris Center staff were hearing them this summer in, in the neighborhood of the Harris Center. Um, so hopefully the owls had a really good breeding year. There were lots of rodents around for them to eat. So survival is likely high. 
that gives you all a good chance of hearing more of them this fall and winter and maybe seeing them uh, in your backyards looking for rodents. Um, so yeah, a young barred owl. So Phil, Miles had a question for you. Um, he was curious if the yellow beak indicated its young status or if its beak is just yellow throughout its whole life. Um, I think I think all all barred owls, if I'm correct, have have a yellowish beak. Yeah, I think that plumage um, shown in the photo here looks to be uh, an adult barred owl. Yes, yeah. so, Pat, um, so Pat asked a question that I also was going to ask for clarification on. I had always heard that that call was a begging call from a juvenile owl for food from it's fledged and it's having trouble. So, yeah. is, but you're saying it's maybe more of an well, alarm call. I'm thinking the, the particular call that we're hearing now sounds to me more like an alarm call, more like the whistle shriek call. Um, the begging call was, is very distinct in, in the late summer. And it's, it sounds very similar to that call, but it's a little more shrieky even than this sound. Can you so do I it? Think there is a distinction. No way. Oh, <laughs> come on. Uh, Give us a try. Just kind of a, it's a high raspy. Uh, it's similar, but it's raspier. It's a little more hissy sounding. Okay. Uh, well, it sounds like a loud hiss. We're all gonna be listening. Um, yeah, so the young the young calls are really morphing now. Um, but I think uh, I think that that is probably the sound of a young bird learning to get his voice. And by August, by the time this call is uh, this call was recorded, um, those birds will have grown a little bit. would have grown from the youngster stage giving that, that hissy call. So yeah, it's somewhere it's not a perfect sound, but it's between the two, the, the begging call and the alarm call. Cool. Thank you, Phil. And thanks for the great questions out there. Awesome. All right. Let's see what's next. Oh, I love this one. Look at these snakes. Um, all right. Here we go. Last Saturday, we were walking the Black Gum Trail following Tom Wessel's book guide and came upon these two snakes, probably garter snakes. The small one was wrapped around the larger one. My guess was that they were mating, but online information say the garter snakes mate in the spring. It is known that when they gather in large masses in the fall in preparation for hibernation, sometimes mating occurs as well. These snakes were not with each other, with others in a clump. They were alone and their only motion was that of their tongues flicking, keeping tabs on us. Thanks, Tricia. So John, what's going on? Were they mating? Were they snuggling? Were they doing something we haven't even considered yet? What's up? Maybe all of the above, Susie. Uh, these are definitely mating snakes. Like there's no question. So you have a large one that is the female and the male has its body wrapped around. I don't know how much the mechanics we have the time to get into here, but you know, the males have hemipenes, these two uh, you know, genitalia that they use to inseminate the female. And these are definitely mating snakes. And uh, as the um, contributor suggested, uh, you know, they do do this in the fall sometimes. It generally happens in the spring when they emerge from their, their hibernation chambers, the hibernacula, and they're all kind of coming out and getting warm and uh, preparing for you know, the, the summer ahead. And that's when most mating occurs, but it does happen sometimes in the fall. And I think it's kind of a product of they're, they're, they're gathering up, getting ready to get into hibernation again. They, they generally come back to the same hibernacula every year. That's one of the big constraints on snakes in the northern part of uh, North America is having the right kinds of hibernacula that have the depth to get away from frost. And that's kind of why they all come together in these these big masses. It's not quite, I mean, there, there is new data about how snakes are more social than we realize, but for the large part, as far as we know, they're trying to just all gather up in the good spots to hibernate. And they happen to all be together when they're doing that. Uh, so in the fall, it's kind of like, hey, I'm here, you're here, you know, let's, maybe let's, we can have a little mating. And uh, the, the females can store sperm, I've read. So I, I think that they could, uh, you know, have offspring with the males that they mate with in the fall, the following year. And um, it's funny to see this question because I just found two garter snakes with uh, 10th grade students I was out with this week. We were out in the, the, the Conval High School forest and we found two snakes right next to each other in a little sunny patch. One was very large and one was quite small. And my speculation was we had a female and a male that were probably both hanging out in a sunny patch. Was there any mating? 
we don't know, but it could have happened if they just happened to be gathering up in the desirable areas at the same time. And, you know, hey, they, they have that as part of their behavioral protocol, and they tend to be a little bit flexible about when mating occurs. So this is definitely mating garter snakes. And, uh, yep, you, you were lucky to witness a magic moment there. Wow. Wow. Thank you. And how spicy. Um, and I did put this in the chat, but if this topic of um, interesting um, mating behaviors in the wild interest you, you can catch the Harris Center Naturalist at Nova Arts in Keene on February 10th from 6 to 7 p.m. We'll be live talking about all of this wild sex and celebration of Valentine's Day on February 10th from six to seven. All right, let's see what's next. Oh, this is cute. Um, there are so many of these little cup-shaped mushrooms on the Jakewith Trail, especially at the beginning of the, of the Hancock. And they are less than 0.25 inches in diameter. These are next to another fungus, two for one from Tony. So John, right back to you, because not only are you our, our reptile guy, but you're our fun guy, ha <laughs> ha. What's up? What's what are they? They look like Reese's peanut butter cups, sort of. I was oh, oh you, you stole it from me, Susie. I, was oh. gonna say, I always think of the wrappers of Reese's peanut butter cups with this species here. Uh, these are striate bird's nest fungi, and there's uh, a multiple types of bird's nest fungus that you can find, but they tend to be very tiny, and they are these little these little cups that have uh, other times these little egg looking uh, things inside these little sort of cylindrical objects that look like eggs. Now, what's interesting here is you don't see those little egg-like uh, objects in these ones because they've already been dispersed. So, you know, all mushrooms are reproductive structures. Their goal is to get spores out into the environment and to disperse spores one way or another. And uh, it's interesting the strategies that some uh, species of fungi have evolved to get the spores out and spreading around and dispersing. And for these bird's nest fungi, they're relying on rain to help splash the spores out. These are sometimes called splash cups is a nickname for bird's nest fungi. And those little egg looking things that you sometimes find are called peridioles and they're sort of uh you know little little objects little little um bodies that hold a lot of spores and the rain falls and it splashes the peridioles out and the spores get out into the environment and they can spread around to grow into new uh mycelium and new bird's nest mushrooms in the future so you found the, the sort of post dispersal phase of the striate bird's nest mushrooms there so John, any, any, th that was awesome, by the way. Thank you so much. And I love the bird's nest fungi anyway. They're just always so beautiful. How about the big mushroom in Tony's picture right here? This kind of big guy. What's yeah, that one? You know, I can make a guess when it comes to these somewhat not so clear images where you don't see the gills of some of these mushrooms, you can only make your best guess. And there's a lot of small tan brown mushrooms, LBMs are sometimes called little brown mushrooms. Uh, I would guess it's some type of milky cap or lactarius, given the sort of peachy color and some of the the, the uh, texture on the stalk. I've been finding a lot of them this time of year. You tend to get a lot of them in the fall. And the way you recognize that that family is you you damage the gills a little bit or break the cap and you see this kind of um, a latex milky goo that starts to emerge a little bit. And there's many species that are in this this family of mushrooms. But I would I would guess that's what it is. But again, without having the ability to see it up close or break some gills, I'm not quite sure. Great. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Always so interesting. Um, oh, look at this, you guys. This little woodland salamander showed up under my watering can. Is it some iteration of a red eft? I have many of those pass through my yard, but I've never seen a solid like this. It's so cool from Carol from October 3rd, 2021. Brett, this looks right up your alley. You're the salamander queen. What can you tell us about this sweet little Sally? Yeah, this um, I get. I've gotten a lot of questions about this particular salamander species this summer and fall. Um, it is actually the not only the most abundant salamander in northeastern forests, but in some accounts may be the most abundant vertebrate. Most of the vertebrates, uh, and this is a surprise people because uh, most of us are familiar with red f's, these um, small salamanders that are bright orange. So red f's are, are bright orange all over, and they have two rows of spots down their back that are encircled in black. And people are really familiar with them because they are one of our few really our only salamander that hangs out above ground in the day. 
So on rainy days, we see them all over the woods um, and, and we're very familiar with them. Most of our other salamanders in, in New Hampshire are, are either um, stream dwellers or um, live under the forest floor or under rotting logs or rocks, which is where redback salamanders live. So they're really common and abundant, but we don't see them that much unless we do something like pick up a water can um, that serves as shelter for them, like what like Carol did. And um, they also have a lot of variation in color. Um, they often have a rust red stripe running down their back, which you can kind of see in this one. Sometimes that stripe is more yellowish in color. Sometimes it's really deep orange. And there's even um, a variety that has no stripe at all and is all gray called the lead back um, phase of these, of these red back salamanders. So they're, they're really common in wood piles. Um, and in my experience, if you go out into the woods in New Hampshire and turn over say five logs, there'll be red back salamanders under at least one of them. And the fall is a, fall and spring are great times to find them. In the summer when it gets really hot, they can retreat really deep beneath the forest floor to try to stay cool. And in the winter, they do the same thing to try to stay not frozen. So this is actually, we were, I was just out um, right before this with a group of Keene State College students doing um, surveys for this particular salamander species and some survey plots we set up behind the Harris Center and we saw dozens of them um, under boards. So they are awesome. And um, thanks for sending that in, Karen. Way to go. Thanks, Brett. And thank you, Carol, for sending this in. It's such a great, um, really common animal that we, we don't often see. So that was so in interesting. Whoa, check this thing out. Anyone have any thoughts on how this came to be up on Mountain Road in Sharon, newly logged area? But Jeremy, I'm wondering if you would be willing to respond to this. I, I do think it falls in your, your wheelhouse. I, I just want to say something about the, the redback salamanders that, that Brett just talked about. They are extraordinary things. And, and uh, I, was, I was pulling apart a brick pile a little while ago, and this was just a pile of bricks. And there were, there were redback salamanders literally had spaces within the, imagine the space between two bricks, and yet somehow they were, they, they were surviving in that in that thing in terms of I'd pull a brick up and there'd be a redback salamander under it. Just incredible. All right, well, what do we have here? So this is a stem of a tree that was presumably cut in this, this, this uh, harvest that happened on the mountain road in Sharon. Um, this isn't two trees, this is just a single tree. Uh, I think what we're looking at here is something called ring shake. And ring shake is the delamination or the separation of the layers between rings. And there are some species that are really well known for having issues with ring sh shake. So for instance, uh, Eastern hemlock, its value is often uh, much, much reduced because of this issue with shake, that is the separation of between tree rings. And so the lumber becomes much less uh, useful and certainly less strong in, 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 in terms of what it can do. Uh, in this case, that does, this doesn't look like hemlock, so this is something else. Um, I'm not sure what species it is, but to me, this looks like the, the shake or the separation, the delamination is occurring at the boundary layer between the heartwood and the sapwood. And the heartwood is the interior of the tree stem that has uh, completely died. And then if we look towards towards the outside of this, the stem there, you move into what's called the sapwood layer. And it's, it's, it's uh, um, you know, again, the same, the same transportive tissue, except that this part of the tissue, there's much more action happening in. The heartwood really has just, there's not much going on there other than the deposition potentially of, of some chemicals from the tree. That's what sometimes makes the heartwood a different color than the sapwood. So you could open a tree like this and the heartwood might appear darker. And it's typically because the tree is, is uh, transporting chemicals and depositing them in that heartwood area. So I'm guessing what happened here is that this tree was cut and then as it dried, there was some differential drying going on and that resulted in the delamination at this heartwood sapwood boundary in the tree. <laughs> I, I, I feel like that's happened to me. I might have ring shake. <laughs> I mean, ring shake, yeah. <laughs> I might have ring shake going on. Oh my goodness, um, that was really, really cool. Does it always happen um, where the line is between the heartwood and the sapwood? 
Yeah, other than in other than in trees that are predisposed to shake, it's it's most common at that boundary layer between the two. Wow, so cool. We are gonna have to put that miles. Let's take a note. That might have to come up in turn the tables. All right, let's see what's going on. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, we have a poll. Um, we're gonna play a couple of sounds and you're gonna listen, and then there'll be a poll to answer what you think it is. So you don't have to put it in the chat, just listen, and then the poll will come up. Okay, here are the choices. New England Banshee, Screech Owl, Red Fox, Fisher, or John Coolish whistling for his dogs on the Halloween Eve. So um, the choices were New England Banshee, Screech Owl, Red Fox, Fisher, or John Coolish. The winning answer was Red Fox at 45%. The Screech Owl was second runner up at 32%. And then it was tied between the New England Banshee and the Fisher. <laughs> John Kulish's ghostly whistling for his dogs came in last. So um, let's see. I, I, I will respond to this because it's in my wheelhouse of the mammals. But if you guessed red fox, that is correct. And, but I guess what I would say is um, it's very interesting because red foxes make a variety of sounds. They've been documented making over 30 different types of vocalization. And that's just one example of a vocalization. And I think our next slide has a question. So, oh, we're gonna listen to this one. You wanna listen to this one? This is my favorite one. Wow. This one's sometimes called the vixen scream. Um, so here's why we put that in there. We, we got this great question from Sue from Keene. And this is what she says, a great picture of the fox. Had an interesting encounter with a fox last night, watching for shooting stars on the deck and a fox growled at me. I turned around and it growled again. So I growled back. I love that Sue growled back at the fox. He started barking aggressively and walked away barking unusual behavior as we see fox here every day and we just watch each other. Do you think just being territorial or rabid? Great question, Sue. I can't see what when that date um, came in. Do you see that on the bottom, Miles? I can't see it on my screen. It was in the summer. She sent it to Great. me. Um, it was either July or I think it was like August. Yeah, that kind of can make sense to me, um, although I was maybe expecting it to be a little earlier, but foxes are very territorial, and that is a lot of what they're, they're talking about in their vocalizations. It's a lot about territory. They also are marking their territories with urine and scat, but they're really vocalizing, and they are particularly vocal if they feel like there's another fox in their territory or another thing in their territory that might be um, interesting in their young. And if you're in summer, you might have had a fox with some young, or you might have just had a, a female fox. They're particularly more territorial than the males. And that's pretty common with mammals. The females will be territorial and the males will have a larger territory that overlaps many, many females' territory. But the, um, the fox, the female fox has a very discreet territory and she will kind of mark it and she'll vocally mark it as well. So you might have been in her territory and normally you see her in the day, but you were out at night, which was probably a surprise to her. Um, and oh, it was August 3rd. Okay, great. Um, so you, when, she, when you're out and she heard you or the fox heard you, it growled. And then when you growled back, it probably assumed that you might be another fox or a, something of um, a concern. So growling is a way of, of a warning. And then it walked away. So no, I don't think it was rabid. I do think it was just being territorial. I don't think it's unusual behavior for a fox at night. They're, that's when they're most vocal and that's when they're most active. When we see foxes, during the day, it's typically um, mating season. You can see them in the daytime. That's um, kind of the end of winter 
or during um, rearing season when they're raising their young, you'll see the male fox out finding food for the young fox. So when you're seeing the fox in the day, it's just out kind of looking for food, trying to do its thing. But at night, that's, that's its time. And maybe you are in its time and in its place. And when you growl back at it, it, it growled back at you. <laughs> so that's my answer for the fox and I'm sticking with it. So good job on the poll, everybody. Let's see what's going on to the next slide. Okay, so notice the, um, the picture shows a lot of leaves and the leaves looks, look like something's happened to them. So what's going on with my beech tree? This morning, I went outside and found lots of beech leaves partially eaten on my deck. When I looked on the ground below, there were many, many more. Is a caterpillar eating them? What's the story? Thanks, Tony. P.S. The beach is next to a cherry and a maple. The other trees don't appear to have the same problem. So I'm going to turn this question over to Jenna because it has all the markings of, could it be a caterpillar? Jenna, what do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, this particular insect, so Jeremy actually is the one who said, I think it's probably saddle prominent, which is a caterpillar that um, turns into yet another boring brown moth. And it particularly likes maple trees. Um, but this, this summer and last summer were high populations of settled prominent. So it's possible that they moved on to other things like beach. So thanks to Jeremy for reminding me that saddled prominent are messy eaters. So um, most likely saddled prominent, it's always hard with the defoliation because you don't, if you don't see the actual caterpillar, you can't say for sure, but um, the interesting part to me was um, this beach was being next to a cherry and a maple, but they don't seem to have the same problem. Um, it's hard to say if the leaves weren't falling to the ground, maybe they were being eaten up above and just not clipped off at the base. I don't know, Jeremy, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I had lots of saddle prominent on, on a sugar maple in my backyard this year and, and uh, not many leaves came down you just started to notice that the canopy looked more and more like Swiss cheese over time. So maybe they just eat this uh, a beach differently than they do a maple. Sort of like how I eat pizza versus how you eat pizza. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the saddle prominent is, um, it's a cyclical outbreak species and it is a native species and it goes into these outbreak years for several years and then it'll um, have low populations for a number of years and then cycle up again. So it's possible that um, next year we won't see as many saddle prominent and then for several years they might be low population and then they might rise again and we might see beech leaves all over people's decks. But I also just wanted to point out, I noticed that it's gotten quite dark and I look like I'm a mystery person, like in a video, you know, when you know, like the person doesn't wanna be identified. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, sorry about that. Got so dark Jen, while we were talking. Jenna, you're not in the witness protection program. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay, I just want to know. Yeah. Um, I, there was a really good question from um, from Mickey here. She was curious uh, who preys on them, and I know um, maybe this is a good question to turn over to Phil because caterpillars are often bird favorite bird food. So well, Phil, and. and it, yeah, Phil might know too, because these particular caterpillars are not fuzzy like the previous one. So birds might like them better. Huh. Okay, they're not fuzzy. So they're probably not prey, or they could be, of the cuckoos. Uh, I think last summer we fielded some questions about yellow-billed cuckoos, which have been calling in the area. Uh, they have an unusual cuckoo kind of call. Uh, but they eat can, hairy caterpillars. Can you do the cuckoo call? I'm trying to get oh, Phil yeah. to do a call. You're really trying to embarrass me. I know. Tonight. I'm trying to get it. Come on. Cuckoo. Right. cuckoo. That, no, that was very good. That's the Eurasian cuckoo. Um, cuckoos have a couple of different vocalizations, but the yellow builds does a uh, cow, 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 cow. Kind of call. That was really um, good. Uh, anyway, yellow builds and black builds cuckoos, which are Neotropical migrants specialize on the hairy caterpillars, and they actually are able to shed their entire digestive tracts uh, after eating these these caterpillars, which typically have uh, toxins in them. Um, however, the smoother caterpillars 
probably favored by Scarlet Tanagers, I would think. Um, I'm not sure about specifically the saddle prominent, but it probably does, if it's a native, it will lead to increased populations of native bird species, which have likely evolved with it. So um, Orioles, Tanagers, some of the larger uh, vireos, red-eyed vireo, which is probably the most common woodland songbird in the summer in our area. Uh, they specialize in caterpillars. So I would think, you know, a few of those species would, would probably be chowing down on saddled prominent. Wow, thank so, you, Phil. Phil. Can I just add one thing that I just thought of? Way back a million years ago, when I was in school doing my master's on this insect, we were catching the adults in those sticky traps to try and test a pheromone lure that we were using. And um, I actually caught a cedar waxwing. It was heartbreaking in the trap. And I, by the time I got to the trap, because I only checked them once or twice a week, it was dead. And it was the saddest day because it was stuck to the glue in the trap. So it must have been going for the moth, right? There were like 25 moths in the trap. Mm -hmm. So there, are, that's just an interesting aside to think that there are, inset, there are birds that are going to specialize on the caterpillar stage. And then there might be birds that want to yeah. feed on the moth stage as well. So Good point. Yeah. And we also caught a bat. It was a very sad summer. Anyway. Wow, wow, Jenna. We might have to have just uh, like stories from your past as the entomologist. Stories from my, my, <laughs> like my traumatic that. saddled prominent summer. Yes. <laughs> yes. And and Phil, I want to thank you for doing the cuckoo call. Uh, I will stop asking you to make bird calls now. So um, let's move on to the next slide. Oh, this does look right up like your alley right here. It says, my brother caught this hawk and was able to get about 10 feet from it on his Chelmsford property. Looks to be a Cooper's hawk that took down another hawk, also possibly a Cooper's hawk. Do you think they were competing males or could this be another scenario from KW? And I think what we're about to see is a video of this. Is this true, Miles? So um, just a warning. So yeah, <laughs> you might if you don't if you don't want to see um, a bird eating another bird or capturing another bird, you can um, turn your you know turn away. But let for those of us that are interested in seeing it, let's play it out. Wow, Phil, what is going on? Tell us what are what are we right. seeing here? Well, it was likely identified correctly as a Cooper's hawk. That's I would agree that this is a a Cooper's hawk. Um, these are young birds, though, both the, um, um, the predator and the prey are juvenile cooper socks. So they were born this past summer. And I, I believe I, I saw this um, photo and video maybe in August or something. I, does anybody know when that came in? But I think it was summer uh, when, uh, when this was sent to us. Um, so that makes sense for the, the time of year when when birds are just out of nests, a young Cooper's hawk would have its uh, juvenile plumage, which means kind of a, a brownish streaky underside. Uh, the adults have a fine orange reddish barring going across the chest. So these ones both have that, that um, brown streakiness on the upper chest and the white speckles on the back. Um, so these are common uh, woodland raptors. They've done really well with suburban development with urbanization. Um, they're a species on the increase for sure, as Christmas bird counts have told us. Uh, so they're doing really well in suburban areas. So, so this looks like it's in a fairly suburban area, just looking at the image. Um, and, and yeah, there are lots of documented cases of cannibalism in raptors. Uh, I think up to 29 species, according to a, a study that was done in, in 2020. Uh, 29 raptor species have had, had examples of cannibalism within the species. So uh, oftentimes it's siblicide. So th this would be an example of siblicide where a sibling um, eats another either nestling or recently fledged fledgling because it's probably the easiest thing to catch. Um, these birds are hungry. They are, they're trying to grow. They're, they're, they're taking on as much food as they can. And, but they're not being as fed as much as they want to a lot of the time. So they're flying around and, um, you know, a, a young, weaker nestling perhaps, or, or recently fledged bird might be easy to catch and easy prey. So indistinguishable from a pigeon or a blue jay. 
Wow, uh, thank as far as you know, this hungry bird talk is concerned. Yeah, thanks, Phil. It's really interesting. I guess it's a bird eat bird kind of world out there. And I'm glad that um, my kids didn't hear that part about sibling. What do you call it? Sibling side. Sibling side. Siblicide. Siblicide. Okay. Wow. On to something a little less gruesome. Saw these little berries or fruit on this tree. I guess wondering what this is. So Jeremy, I'm gonna send this to you. It. I see woody stems. I don't. I. I don't know. I see leaves and I see. I see you. I think you need to answer this question. There's no sibling side going on in this picture. That's good. Um, so this is a, a witch hazel, which is a, a common shrub that we find, or American witch hazel. It's a common shrub that we find in this region, oftentimes in a in a the understory of a, a maple stand or a, a birch maple ash complex, something like that. Um, and those little berries are in fact seed, pod, seed pods. Uh, I'm going to back up a second because the cool thing about about uh, witch hazel is it's our last bloom of the year. So they don't bloom until mid to late fall. And they have these wonderful blossoms that are like a little slender yellow uh, petals that come out and uh, you can just catch them in the woods. It doesn't last long. They're very uh, sensitive petals and or, or um, you know, a, a few weeks and it's, it's over. It's easy to miss it any year. Um, but it's this beautiful bloom at the at the end of the, at the end of the growing well way past the end of the growing season, and uh, if you catch it right, they have a, a wonderful fragrance too. But it, it oftentimes it that that it doesn't smell when I get to a flower, so I think it's a pretty limited time. But these are the seed pods that result from that, and uh, I should back up a second. The the flowers are 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 uh, um, pollinated by a moth. Uh, that spreads pollen. And then these are the seed pods and they begin to develop immediately, but then go um, dormant over the winter and then uh, begin to expand and grow in the, 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 the summer. And then they will release their seeds again, sort of towards mid fall. So, you know, in the next couple of weeks, it's really cool. These release their seeds with an explosive. There's two seeds in each pod and, um, they, the seeds dry in a differential fashion, or the components of the seeds dry differently. So there's a, they, they literally shoot the seeds out. And I guess people talk about these seeds going 40 feet, although uh, from what I've read, it's more like 20 feet is, is, is the norm. But these, these two seeds will pop out uh, because the seed coat, the, the, the pod has dried differentially. It creates a little spring, like a catapult within, within it. And uh, the seeds get ejected and they take another year before they um you know they that they, they, they would uh, begin to to root next spring and 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 try to grow so american witch hazel a great wow. Component of wow i had no idea that that they had that explosive seed dispersal that's so cool jeremy have you ever seen it or like you know witnessed it could it's not like yeah. a jewel weed where you can touch it and it pops it. Yeah, no, I don't. I, maybe, I, you know, now now that I know this, because I just learned this um, recently. I, now that I know this, it might be worth touching some brown ones that look like they're they're ready to go and yeah. see if that that makes them kick out the seeds. But no, I've never seen it. Better wear some eye protection. <laughs> Okay. All right. On to our final slide. Oh, we should put a graphic warning on this. We are ending our autumn edition on a um, on another note of, of animal eats animal for Halloween. So here we go. My 1000 gallon fish pond has goldfish and lots of frogs. Today I came across a leopard frog eating another leopard frog. Sure enough, they eat anything they can get in their mouth. And this one has a big mouth. This is from Alan um, from Fitzwilliam. And let's see, Brett, um, this looks like something for you. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, this is a pretty amazing photo. Um, I guess I'll start looking at the species. Um, it does, these, 
Both of these frogs have spots on their legs, so I can see why you might think that they're leopard frogs, but leopard frogs have very well-defined spots with rings around them and are also quite uncommon in the Monadnock region. Um, the, the species of frog that is doing the eating is, on the other hand, quite common and has a lot of variability in the way that it looks, but one thing that is distinctive is its kind of green face and um, the lack of ridges running along its back um, and its eating habits are also somewhat distinctive. Um, so this is a bullfrog um, and they are uh, voracious predators of all sorts of things. Um, they can grow to be quite large as I'm sure some of you have seen, but they can eat everything from um, insects, crayfish, small fish to rodents, hatchling turtles, ducklings, snakes, um, and as we see here, other frogs. And it's a hard to tell the species of the frog that it's eating from just the legs. Um, it could be a green frog. It also could well be another bullfrog. Um, they are also known for their cannibalist uh, tendencies and will basically eat whatever fits in, into the gape of their mouth. Um, so this, this frog may have been attracted to the pond for the fish and um, was lucky enough to, to catch something else while it was there. And um, it's a pretty remarkable photo. So, and a good yeah. one for Halloween, even though it's from the summer. So, wow, frogs are, are um, truly the only the only frog that sometimes intimidate me. That species, when you see a really big one um, on the road at night, where I'm always out looking for amphibians on the road at night, uh, really big bullfrogs. I, I find them a little intimidating because they they can eat, you know just about anything, so. Goodness gracious, Brett. And now I know something that might scare you. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll have to rename this autumn edition of Ask a Naturalist, um, Ask a Cannibal Cannibalist, because we've had a couple of maybe cannibal questions. It's perfect for Halloween, but on yeah, that it's like note. like the horror flick edition. Exactly. Nature's, nature's like horror flick. Well, maybe we'll have to do a special next year on that. But thank you guys all so much for joining us tonight. And a special thanks to all our panelists who did a great job answering questions. And to um, Margaret for making it look so beautiful and Miles for making it run so smoothly. And again, all of you, keep sending in your questions, stay curious. Um, and we will see you January 20th for our winter edition. Send in your mysteries anytime. We're always up for them and um, get outside. So thank you guys very much and see you again. Ciao.